Hello, my name is Ed Brown, Managing Director at the American Academy of Advanced Thinking. Today I will be speaking with Sean Andrews, a senior paralegal for one of the fastest growing law firms in Metro Atlanta. Our talk is titled Time Management and Organizational Skills for Paralegals. Just to give you some background on Sean, has a background in general litigation, personal injury, medical malpractice, and nursing home cases. She is currently working to expand her legal experience into intellectual property litigation so she can continue to grow, expand, and be challenged. Thank you, Sean, for sharing your insights today. You're very welcome, and thank you so much for having me on board. My pleasure. First, let's right get into it. What is a senior paralegal? So a senior paralegal is usually defined as someone that has at least 7 to 10 years of experience. You have usually a BS degree, which is a degree in either criminal justice or maybe even paralegal studies, as well as a ABA paralegal certificate, and ABA stands for American Bar Association. Okay. And is there a backstory for how you got into the paralegal profession? Yes. The backstory for me is, ironically, over 16, almost 17 years ago, I remember that I was working as a bill collector, and I knew that I wanted something more challenging, and obviously within my profession that I actually received my degree in. So I was flipping through the employment guide, which used to be a really big thing years ago here in Atlanta where you can actually find jobs. And I saw this ad that broadcasted, if you're interested in, you know, a paralegal certificate, you know, come to this, I guess you could say it was like an informative seminar to see if it might be something you might be interested in. And then it outlined all these different duties that sound like something that would be of interest in case you want to build onto it and maybe go to law school. So I was like, you know what, I'll go to the informational session and see if it's something I'm interested in. And, of course, it was. And so then I would say maybe – a month or two later, I had enrolled in the program, took the 10 month course, exceeded, did very well. And I would say, probably after I completed the program, I was able to go on board with a law firm that wanted someone that they can train. So it was an excellent program where it gave me a job lead to actually get into the field. And sure enough, 16 years later, here I am. Okay, and, still has, working it, as a paralegal. and has it been all that you anticipated? It has. I definitely had a lot of experiences working from small, medium, and large law firms. So I have an idea of what I like and what I don't like and what my preferences are. So with that being said, I can say that working in a small law firm, which is where I started, it helped me to grow and be able to handle working at a larger size firm because I knew how things were supposed to be done properly from the beginning to the end. Okay. And and what is your role as a senior paralegal at your law firm? My current role as a senior paralegal at my law firm that I'm currently working at involves many duties, and that can entail medical chronologies, which is basically, obviously, we request medical records and we'll summarize those medical records prior to the actual attorney taking a deposition so he'll be aware of exactly what pre-existing injuries as well as current injuries that person may have. Also, scheduled depositions, and a deposition is, you know, testimony taking of an individual by a court reporter where an attorney is asking them a series of questions and it's recorded of their account of the particular incident, whether it be a dog bite case, motor vehicle accident, or medical malpractice where they were injured, whether it be in surgery or something along those lines. So those are two of the biggest things that I do, but I also deal with vendors when it comes to either scheduling a court order for a deposition, getting invoices paid. I also deal with requesting checks so that we can get medical records. And then I also do things along the lines of getting open records requests, which will be either police reports, 911 audio calls. Uh, Sometimes I request autopsy reports. So there is a wide range of different things that I do, but those things that I just named are just the gist of it. Okay, okay. And it sounds like a lot that you all do. What time management and organizational skills does it take to excel at your job? The time management and organizational skills it takes to excel at my job is critical. And the first thing is you have to be able to multitask, and you also have to be able to prioritize. And any paralegal knows that whatever plan that you may have for today, someone else may have another plan for you. And that basically means 
somebody might have something last minute that might throw your day off in, in conjunction of what you have planned to get done. But the key is you have to write things down. You have to calendar. You need to know what's going on in your cases. Uh, and that can involve when discovery ends or if you have to get a deposition schedule, making sure that you, you know, lined up a court reporter. So a lot of it involves, again, I cannot stress this enough, writing things down, putting things on the calendar, whether it be for yourself as well as an attorney. That way you're making sure you're doing your follow-up work and you're not missing anything in terms of what needs to get done and having either a document or a medical record or a police report in time for an attorney to either meet with a client, prepare for a deposition, or even prepare for a mediation and or trial. And so what is it? safe to say that you operate from a like a day planner or some kind of scheduling uh, itinerary so that you can stay on top of the responsibilities that the attorneys give you? Yes. Like, for example, there are several ways that I keep up with my flow of work and also calendaring and time, or, time organization and organizational skills. For example, Outlook is a big thing that I use in terms of calendaring, and that's also how attorneys are aware of what's going on as to what I put on their calendar. But whenever I receive an assignment in an email, I like to print my emails out so that I can have a hard copy. And then if there's a deadline in there, because usually I always ask the attorney, do you have a deadline of when you need me to get this done? If he does or does not, I try to at least put a hard date on my calendar so that I know that I need to have this particular task done by a certain date. And then also if he does it, I try to give myself a reasonable amount of time to get something to an attorney. That way I can beat him or her to the punch before they ask me. So again, always put something on the calendar, print out my email so that I have a hard copy. And then usually every single day I have my inbox that I go through to make sure that I'm following all my follow-up tasks and making sure that I'm cross-referencing my hard copy with my calendar and making sure that I'm meeting those deadlines. Okay. And what recommendations or key tips would you say to paralegals uh, as they try to determine what their day-to-day -day activity should be? Is there a one, two, three bullet points that you could provide paralegals? Yes. I would definitely say that in a day-to-day day -day profession of a paralegal, you definitely need to prioritize. You need to make sure that you maybe for some individuals it might be better for them to write down exactly what they need to get done for that day as well as make sure that if you have any deadlines that need to be met for I would say either that same day, the next day, or within a week, make sure that you have those things outlined, whether it be to get a court reporter or to set up a mediation or to get dates for a deposition. I would make sure that you get those things done as well as if you need subpoenas. So the key really is to make sure that you prioritize. Go through your stack of stuff of what you have. Make sure that you pull those things out that are most priority, even if it's discovery that needs to go out today or if you're on a, you know, have a document section that has to go out today. Um, make sure that you have those things pulled out. The next thing is if you have some things that you're not sure on how to handle or what should be the next step instead of making an executive decision, you need to ask as many questions as necessary with the attorney that is actually handling the case to make sure that you're meeting all of his requirements and making sure you're getting the task done in the most efficient way. Okay. And, and I know you have nearly 20 years of experience. Uh, in those 20 years, I'm sure you learned a lot. What vital skills have you learned over those years that are more key now than they were uh, early on or you wish you knew now or then what you knew now? I would say – Two or three things that stand out specifically for me are being a paralegal, we are now in the age where there are nurse paralegals, and nurse paralegals usually do medical chronologies, but sometimes you may work at a law firm where there are no nurse paralegals, and if that's the case, I think it's very key that if you are asked to do a medical chronology, that you really understand what is being asked upon you when you're doing a medical chronology to make sure that you're pulling out the information that is needed and critical for an attorney and helping him for preparing for a deposition or a mediation. So I would say that I have learned how to, I don't want to stretch it by saying perfect, but I feel comfortable enough to be able to read medical records and be able to put that information into a medical chronology where an attorney can actually read it and say, oh, okay, well, this 
this person has a pre-existing history of X, Y, Z, but they're claiming this as X, Y, Z as their current injuries, which could be the same as their pre-existing injuries. Those kinds of things are important, and you want to highlight that in, in your medical chronology. Those kind of things, I didn't know that years ago because I didn't really have anyone as time I guess you could say in the beginning, to really point those things out as to what I was looking for. And so before coming to this firm, I've been able to build on my medical chronology experience and get some constructive criticism from an attorney who said that this is what I'm looking for, this is what I need. And also the same thing with deposition summaries. It's like you want to pull out the meat and potatoes, all the history about, you know, where someone may necessarily be from or their um, education history is not necessarily as critical as, you know, how did they get their experience, how, what makes you an expert, or what exactly happened in this particular instance where you were a witness, what did you see, what did you do? Those are more critical as opposed to where somebody is actually from. Okay. Uh, one of the things that when I, you may not know this, when I did some research on some of your skills, one of the things that came out, I think you probably gathered over the years, is that you have a knack for getting people to call you back. I know that's a big thing when it comes to your profession. Uh, what, is there a few keys or is it a, a skill you develop or is a talent you have? How do you get people to call you back, the people that you have to get in touch with either for up count, upcoming trial or for an attorney? How do you, how do you make that happen? I think that's a very good question, and I know that sometimes people can get frustrated when you place a phone call to someone and you expect them to just call you back. Well, unfortunately, in the legal field, it just doesn't quite work that way, and a lot of times people don't understand it. When a case is involved in litigation or it's in lawsuit and it's actually getting ready to go to trial, or even if it's not going to trial, if they are a participant in the sense that where they were a witness or they were employed somewhere where an incident happened and they happen to be either at work that day or saw something, it's a situation where we're going to have to either depose them or get their statement. And a lot of times it just really boils down to patience. And it's a part of that follow-up work. It's one of those things that you have to do and you have to become comfortable and familiar with it, and it's something that you have to do it every single day as well as part of your career. So the way I get people to call me back, I may have to call them more than 10 times, but I'm extremely persistent. I'm always nice. I'm always professional. And a lot of times I will get pushed back because a lot of people will say that they don't want to be involved. They don't know anything. They don't know this. They don't know that. But, again, I'm always extremely nice. I try to make them feel as comfortable I try to make the, the situation as inconvenient as possible and make an attorney at their disposal easily accessible so that they don't have to go out of their way in terms of either driving or making anything too difficult where they won't participate. I try to make it as easy as possible. So, again, I, keep, I, I will call and I will leave message after message after message, and eventually they will call me back. And, again, I will get pushed back, and you can definitely tell in their, in their voice and their tone that they don't want to be a part of it, but I just keep pushing and saying, hey, you know, I really want you to cooperate because if you don't, you know, eventually they will subpoena you, and you don't want that. It's always easier to cooperate voluntarily as, in, as opposed to involuntarily. So, again, I'm just pretty persistent, but you just got to have to keep calling. It's one of those things where it's a part of your job that it's time-consuming, and it almost can seem hopeless, but believe it or not, if you keep calling a person several times and if you are pretty adamant and strong in your message that you leave, eventually nine times out of ten people will call you back. Okay. And I realize that those skills and other skills are important as a paralegal. I understand that when you first get into the profession, there might be some hiccups or learning curves that you have to um, – encounter, have you seen or witnessed early mistakes or mistakes typically even with professional and or senior paralegals that they make that you say, oh, God, I thought they would have been over that by now. They still make that mistake. Is there one or two mistakes you see over and over again? You know what, from time to time I think you will see mistakes, and I think that just like anyone else, paralegals are humans as well as attorneys are, and sometimes it can be the simple 
a simple letter that you've seen, which you can see is a form letter, and someone forgot to either change the, you know, the, I would say maybe who the letter is addressed to, they forget to either change that. And, of course, that's a simple mistake, but those kind of things can happen, or sometimes I've seen over the years where someone will forget to, you know, reserve a court reporter, which, of course, you never want that to happen because you have all these people getting ready to show up and then for a deposition, and then you don't have a court reporter. So from time to time, you might see small things along those lines when it comes to, like I said, editing a letter that you didn't change or not reserving a court reporter. But I think that over the years, as you continue to craft your skill, you develop a checklist. So when you're either doing a deposition or a MedCron or you're requesting certain documents, you start to create these charts and lists so that you can have those as your follow-up and checklist to go back and make sure that you dotted all your I's, crossed all your T's, and make sure that you have everything that you need so that you tend not to have those kind of mistakes. I mean, again, every now and then you might have something small that falls through the crack, but most of the time those things are fixable, especially if you catch it in time. It seems like, based on what you said, that a system or a process that you build on from case to case to case so that you're not – I guess as they say, um, reinventing your will helps you become a more effective paralegal as opposed to a one-off. For example, I'm thinking that if I was a paralegal and I you know, had a system for doing a, a med crime, and then instead of redu- uh, redoubling my efforts the second time that I just go back and maybe cut and paste in or use that as a, as a process, would that help if I use the process I come up with the first time and build on that as opposed to reinventing the wheel every time I do the same thing again and again? Almost definitely. You know, just like you said with the medical chronology, we have a form that we use to help us in the sense of how the actual micron should look for every single prong that you do from either this particular plaintiff to the next plaintiff. So that basically means that, you know, you would have a chart that's created and you basically would plug the information uh, plug the information in as you go along. And my best advice is I like to have two monitors. That way I can actually read the medical records on the right side of the screen, and I can type the information in on the left side of the screen. And you always want to put what they would consider like a abbreviation for certain terms that you're using, but then you also have definitions. That way if somebody were to come behind me, If they don't understand medical terminology, the definition is already right there for them, so they don't have to go on the Internet and actually look up and see what that word means. So, yes, charts are very key when doing medical chronologies as well as whenever you're requesting medical records. We also have a chart for that. That way, if someone were to come behind me, they can see that I've actually created this medical chart. They'll see what medical records have been requested, and if there's any additional records that need to be requested, they'll be able to determine that from what we've already sent a request for. So, yes, charts are very important. Okay. And as we wrap up, are there any resources or additional tools you would recommend paralegals to embark upon that will help them in the role of the paralegal or their day-to-day activities? Most definitely. I think that as time goes on, obviously the law continues to change, but also the way paralegals do things, also continues to change. I think there's also a better way of doing things as time goes on due to technology. So I think that if you are working in a law firm where you're dealing with a lot of document productions, I think you definitely need to be up on your technology. I think you need to be aware of how to use maybe programs such as Relativity, which is a document management system, on how to organize documents, especially if you're getting ready to produce them. You can use that as a system to either flag documents that you're not going to produce flag documents that you are going to produce or flag documents that you are considering as privileged. And then I think that as a paralegal, you always need to have meetings maybe quarterly with other paralegals in your firm to also share information as to what's the latest resource out there that might be useful for a paralegal to use, whether it be LexisNexis. For example, you can use that to do accurate reports. An accurate report is how to basically find an, it's, it's basically like a background check on someone if you're trying to locate someone, whether it be by phone number and or address if you need to subpoena them. Um, also, I think another good tool would be those CLEs, which is continuing legal education. They also have those for paralegals. And every now and then they will have, they being law firms, will have a CLE at their firm where a paralegal can go and participate and learn about 
you know, either a new piece of equipment or technology or even a document management system that might be even more helpful to make that paralegal's life a little easier to do their job better on a day-to-day. So I think those three things are most important as well as as an individual paralegal, if you're really passionate about your job and you want to be able to do it again as best as you can, I think you should also go out on your own limb and do some self-directed studies, whether it be take a a paralegal course, advanced paralegal course online, or even maybe uh, some reading online that involves paralegal skills if you want to, you know, up the ante and increase your experience. So self-directed studies, whether it be an online course, reading a book that's, you know, up to date of new technology or new skills or how to do things, I think all of those things would be helpful in becoming a better and more experienced and organized time management paralegal. Yeah, I understand you took an intellectual property course recently. Is there a takeaway that you came away with that you didn't know prior to taking that particular course? I did. The intellectual property course that I took, I thought it was very interesting because obviously I have no experience in intellectual property at all. And I found it very challenging because it's a field of law that, again, I don't have any experience in, but I think that as time goes on, we can definitely see that that is where law, social media, all of that is falling into intellectual property because it involves copyrights, trademarks, patents, things that people are creating that are important that they want to protect because they are an inventor of these particular items. And so I think the takeaway for me is someone that hadn't been to school in a, in a while since I received my paralegal certificate back in 2001, I found it rewarding because I'm able to learn something new and different outside of my own practice group, which I've been a part of for the last 15, 16 years. So I think that if you're interested in something different within your legal field, I think you definitely should research and then also act upon it and then go for it because if you have the opportunity to learn something new and make more money, why not do it? I agree. I agree. Any final points to be made as we conclude? I just, again, I think that if you're a paralegal and you're passionate about your work, I just think that you should try to do everything within your power, use all the resources you can, ask all the questions you need, and just really just try to do a better job than the job you're doing. And always remember that if you go to an attorney's office, make sure that you take your pen and paper with you. Always make sure to do that because you never know when he or she's going to ask you to do a task, and then here you are, you don't have a pen and paper. So I cannot stress enough. Always write things down, always do your follow up, and just be consistent and diligent. And I think that if you do all of those things, you will be a paralegal that will excel and you will be recognized for it from your employer as well as your coworkers. Well, thank you, Ms. Andrews. Chock full information. I appreciate your time. And um, I'm sure that was informative for paralegals and would be paralegals. So thank you for your time, and you have a great day. You do the same, and thank you so much for having me on board today. My pleasure. Bye-bye.